let me welcome everybody to today's teaching devotional, um, Epignosis Daily or Epignosis Online. And on behalf of me, Pastor Fela Becker and Lady Patricia Becker and all you amazing, wonderful, faithfuls of FGCI London branch. And to anybody who will be watching this later, we say welcome to our teaching devotional, which is held daily from midday to 1 p.m. The song that has been playing in the background, I do not have any copyright claim to it. It's just purely for the basis of our meeting here. I also see that except you're in a place where you are working and it's busy, you know, I remind you that if you miss a few weeks or a few days, we still have our YouTube channel. You can go there to pick up a few things and pieces from there. Subscribe to the YouTube channel, share it. And at the same time, and when you subscribe, you can click on the notification bell so that anytime that, you know, the message which is recorded is uploaded, you'll be notified of it being ready for you to consume. Once again, I also say that, you know, um, shortest pencil is better than longest memory. So by all means, except it's, it's impossible for you to do so, make notes, do bullet points, especially the Bible verses that will come up will be very needful for you in times of you defending your faith. Hallelujah. So let us do a quick recap of what um, we've done so far. And then whilst we wait for others to join, and then we will deal, go dig into the meat of what we are supposed, um, <clears throat> excuse me, to do today. All right. So here is our topic that we are dealing with: a very crucial, crucial, critical message or teaching that I would have thought this is something that every every believer should know, like the back of their hand. Every believer should know, like the back of their hand. Every believer should know like the back of their hand. Every believer, without exception, ministers alike, lay preachers alike, you must know this like the back of your hand. It is absolutely the key to so many areas of misunderstanding when it comes to the word of the living God. So once again, like in my own fashion, I do this because I always say that short expenses better than longest memory. So I just need to just quickly go through this just to jog our memory. If maybe a few areas are still patchy, well, welcome, uh, Auntie Mary. Welcome, Sister Jennifer. Welcome, Sister Hetty. I can see she's still trying to connect up, but that is fine. No worries. All right. So let us go into this. How to know if a message being preached is according to the truth of the word of God. And this is part number 17. We said that the word truth there means reality or accomplished fact. And it refers to what Jesus has done. We also ask the question, what is the major emphasis of the entire Bible? Is it agriculture, entrepreneurship, how to make money? No, the major emphasis is what Christ, God has done in Christ to remove sin's nature. Okay, that effect of Adam's sin has affected the whole world so much that <clears throat> it is the, it's what is responsible for so many things in our world today for those outside Christ. We also said, who determines who determines what should be the main emphasis um, of the teachings of the Bible? That is very important. Who determines it? Jesus is the one that determines. So when you go out and anybody is trying to argue with you and say that, how do we know whether um, the Bible is true? How do we know that whether whoever is teaching this is true? Just let answer back to them and let them know that Jesus is the one that shows us how the Bible is to be interpreted. So would they want to listen to what Jesus said or not. So Jesus laid it down and gave it to the apostles. So we have a style, we have a format, we have a style. So they determined the two, Jesus first, the head of the church, then he set the example and then gave it to the apostles. Okay, so that should clear that up. You must let whoever you are dealing with, your interlocutor, understand that that is the format. That is why nobody can just wake up and interpret the Bible anyhow. No, you must follow Jesus' style which he gave to the apostles and follow the apostle style. So Jesus' style is known as the doctrine of Christ. The apostles is known as the, apostle, the apostles' doctrine, but they, they are actually the same thing. That means we cannot pick any Bible verse, character or historical story and make it fit anything that we want. No, there is a style laid down by Jesus. There's a style laid down by the apostles with the apostles copied from Jesus, which is referring to Luke 24. Very, very important. That's why I keep on repeating it. All right. Galatians chapter 1, 6 to 10. The Passion Translation brings the flavor out. 
I am shocked over how quickly you have strayed in your mind from the anointed one who called you to himself by his loving mercy. I am frankly astounded that you now embrace a distorted gospel. Verse 7, that is a fake gospel. That is simply not true. There is only one gospel, one explanation to the gospel, the gospel of the Messiah. Yet you have allowed those who mingle law with grace to confuse with lies. So the another gospel is distorted because it is mixed with explanations of law, requirements of law with grace. Verse 8, anyone who comes to you with a different message than the grace gospel that you have received will have the curse of God upon them. That means there'll be a limitation. It will not amount to anything. It will not get anywhere. They will gather people. It will, it will seem big organization, many, many people. But when you go inside there, they have not learned anything. So the whole thing is a waste. It's like it, the, the idea of it is like, you know, building something and then the whole building crumbles. So this curse here is not an insult. What it means that it will be vain. See, it will, it will be vague. Yes, if you go into that building, yes, people have gathered. What are they teaching there? What are they teaching there? What are they teaching there? If it is not grace with no conditions, so we get used to it, and they begin to add conditions to it, they will be there, they will be jumping and shouting, but it will be vain, it will be vague. You see, it will be, it will, it will be, it will be, it's doomed to fail. Those principles they are teaching there, it will look good, smells good, feels good, sounds plausible, sounds intelligent, but at the end of it, the person will not get anything out of it. How do we know the person will not get anything out of it? That after listening to those people for so many years, they still don't know their rights in Christ. They still don't know who they are in Christ. They are not confident in who they are in Christ. They are still praying with ifs, please, oh God, I beg you, it means that they have not learned. They have not learned. So that whole teach, that whole period that the person spent in that place has become a waste. That is what that place means. The word curse there is not an insult. It means impediment. It's like you come and hit against a roadblock. You 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 know you hit a roadblock. You know you you come you you hit something. You can't go forward. That's why I said for even if we or an angel appeared before you to give you a different gospel than what we have already proclaimed. So there was a, a model that we were proclaiming. You see, that's why I said proclaim. That means there was a style that we were proclaiming. God's curse will be upon him. Once again, the word curse there is limitation, doom. It will be empty, vague, smells good, feels good, sounds good, sounds intelligent, sounds plausible, but the persons or the group of persons listening in will not be able to get any profit from it. Profit meaning, they will not be able to apply anything to their lives. They, they are still confused. They are unsettled. They are unsure. They don't know who they are in Christ. They don't know who they are in Christ. They are still living by conditions, thinking that it's dependent on some performance. That is what it means. Back to square one. Back to the square one. Why? Because the law had a case. The law. The reason why the law was given was because that there was a nature in them. And no matter what they did, they could not be accepted. So you have gone back to square one. Is the meaning of the God? God is not present in that. The word "cares" there is absent. See, the works of God, the profitability of God is absent. Absent. I'll make it clear. No matter who they are, please take note of that. No matter. No matter. No matter. No matter. No matter. No matter who they are, that brings you a different gospel than the grace gospel. You have received. Let them be condemned and cursed. Okay. So we, 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 we said, Paul said that he's not trying to be popular with men and he's not trying to water down the message. And, he, and if he does not do that to, only to please people, then you'll not be a true servant of, of the Messiah. The same thing he repeated again in 2 Corinthians 11. Welcome, Stanina, bless you. 2 Corinthians 11, 2 to 4. And then... It's from the verse. Two. Let me do the let me do the verse two. I've, I've been jumping the verse two. For I am zealous for you with a godly eagerness and divine jealousy. For I've betrothed you or I've, I've married you. You see, like I've married, I've presented you in marriage to one husband to present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, when he used the word chaste virgin, he's not talking about something sexual. He's just using a, a, a figure of speech. You know, that means pure in your mind, whereby you have not been corrupted. See, you have not been corrupted from the message that grace. Is not by any works, 
Grace is in the past tense. Grace is without conditions. Your sins will never be counted against you forever. That pure mind. That's why he came to the verse 3 and said, but now I am fearful, lest that even as the serpent beguiled, deceived Eve by his cunning, so your minds may be corrupted and seduced from your wholehearted and sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So these guys, when Paul taught them, you know, they didn't, they didn't hear any other gospel. So they were pure in their mind. They were, they, the pure means that they were one-minded. They knew that this is the, this the, this is the message. Then after a time, they started listening to other people. And the messages that were list they were listening to other people, these people were now beginning to inject in their preaching conditions, future tense, performance, requirements, and a mixture. And they were slowly, these guys in Corinth were slowly receiving it. Just like you say, oh, it really doesn't matter. You know, I, I, I've tried to see, I, when he talks, you know, he's making some sense though, but you can see that in his preaching, future tenses can be found, conditional tenses can be found, con uh, conditions can be found, you know, uh, uh, requirements can be found, you know, law can be found, you know, all those things are, can be found, you know, but because it sounds, it sounds. You know, I wanted to play you a clip, but because it's a video and I don't want the man's name to come for you, for me to think that them, but it's something that is even going on. This guy has gained popularity. I'll give you the name. I'll give you the name of his program. I'll not give you the name of the man. He calls it Command Your Morning. And it is being spread everywhere. You know? So I said, you know what? Let me just listen to this guy. Why? And I look at the view so many. And I did not even listen to him. Even, 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 the, even the title, even the title, the title, the title is even questionable. Because you see, the idea why he put command your morning. See, I want to show you how subtle it is. Follow me here. Follow me here. The title looks cool. What is he trying to say? That when you wake up in the morning, take charge, command your morning, so that you know no other things can happen. But it looks accurate, but it's not accurate. I'll show you where, where, where it's not accurate. Is it now? that I am going to command my morning so that things line up for me. I am in Christ. I am already in a place of higher than them. But when I, when I speak things for it to happen, it's not that because that, you know, um, I'm, um, because I didn't speak, then things went bad. And now, you know, what, you are, it's just taking authority. You are just taking authority. But the way he, he designed it, it looks like that, you know, if you don't do that, if you don't command them, the, 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 the things will go wrong. And I listened to him and only about two minutes or three minutes into his speech, I could just see all things coming wrong into it. But of course, the masses don't know what I, we know here. So they cannot see where the error is. See that now? I wanted to play that video, but I won't do that. So that is the same thing here. It's a very slow process. You might think that I'm listening. Oh, somebody sent me a video. Oh, yeah, I know he's not, he's not, he's not right, but you know, um, he, he's making some sense. But bit by bit, something about him will endear itself to you. That's what you're talking about here in these guys that were seduced. Seduction is a slow process. Okay. Then that's why he came to the verse four and said, For you seem readily, you don't even put up even a defense, you don't even question it. You don't even question it. If a man comes and preaches another, the Greek word another is heteros than the one we preach, or if you receive a different heteros, Greek word, spirit from the one you receive, or a different heteros, gospel, from the one you receive and welcome, you tolerate it. So we said the word there is a heteros, which implies another kind, altered, different, and it's referring to the way the message of Christ is explained. So let me bring something here, because this is the area that I couldn't get for so many years. I knew that the gospel was Christ, Christ was crucified, Christ died, Christ resurrected. And I said that anybody that is not preaching that, you know, is not preaching the gospel. That is accurate 100%. But there was another area I could not see. Because many can preach, many are preaching Christ died, he was, Christ was crucified, he was buried, he rose. However, after that, they are now saying that if you do not do A, B, C, D, then you will not get the blessing. That is where the another gospel comes in. Can you see that? Can you see now? So it is not, it's not, it's not, it's not just enough 
for the person to say Christ died because that's where some get confused. Oh, but Pastor Fred, he's preaching, you know, he's preaching uh, that Jesus was crucified. He died, you know, as our substitute, you know. And um, so, yeah, that is the gospel. No, that is why Paul brought it clear. He said that they are mixing law with grace. Law with grace. We read it. Mixing law with grace. So they say, yes, Jesus was crucified all right. Jesus died for us all right. Jesus spent three days and three nights all right. He resurrected all right. However, don't think that you make heaven. However, don't, and my prayer for you is that, you know, you, you make heaven. However, so you can see they are bringing in, they are cleverly injecting conditions. That is another shade added to the gospel. Can you, can you see the difference now? So it's not it's not just that the person is preaching Christ that Christ oh then oh he's he's preaching he's preaching grace that the truth no once he starts to inject the person starts to inject conditions future tense performance to be accepted then it is no longer grace and it's no longer grace he has now strayed it means that the concept of grace is still not clear in this person's mind. And I was like that because for so many years, I was still saying, yes, yes, Christ died. Yes, 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 yes. He was buried. Yes, yes. But I got stuck. I got stuck when I went to a place like Deuteronomy 28. You see, I got stuck. I got stuck. See, so I'm saying, yes, Christ died. But I'm not saying that if you hearken to the voice of the Lord your God, <laughs> Deuteronomy 28, and you do that which is right, then, you see, you see that. I was preaching grace, but I was still putting conditions. I was preaching grace, but I was still preaching conditions. And I did that for so many years, I couldn't see. And that is why many cannot see. So if the focus, if the focus is not the grace of Christ, that is what God gave freely to man in Christ, then it is another gospel. That means if it's given free as a gift, then why are there conditions? We also talked about the book of Revelation. We said the book of Revelation is not different from the book of epistles because it follows the same style of the epistles, okay? Because it has past tense, Revelation 1, 5. And Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead. First begotten is a, is a term used for Jesus after resurrection. So that means the book of Revelation follows on over the facts of after resurrection, what we have in Christ. Then look at the tenses. And to him, here, yeah, over here. And to him, and to him that loved, past tense, and washed, same format. Verse 6, and had made us. So he establishes that we are already washed. He establishes that we are already loved. He establishes that we are already made kings already. So that cannot change. So if you read chapter 3, chapter 4, chapter 5, to chapter 21, 22, and you begin to some future tense, then it requires special interpretation. In fact, most of the time, it is just talking about what has taken place in Christ. Most of the time. See that? So in essence, what he's what, what still trying to say is that any vision or book or movie or song or testimony or doctrine or interactions with angels, that lacks the all-important permanent assurance of the eternal nature of Christ's work can be safely termed as another gospel. That means that in, in studying even the book of Revelation with the heavy involvement of angels, imageries, and figures of speech, the test in agreeing with what was seen, what was heard, and written by John will be written in connection with all that Christ has done as referenced from Genesis to Revelation. So in the book of Revelation, they all bear the same theme, salvation by faith in Christ. So the book of Revelation is not about politics, popularly known so. No, it's still the same theme of salvation by faith in Christ. But with heavy images, why? because he was talking to Jews. Most of the symbols in the book of Revelation are the same symbols in the Old Testament. So look, we said about these things then. In other words, the fact that a man has taught the gospel well in the past is not a license for him to teach another gospel 
or for the audience not to be able to differentiate, distinguish if he's preaching a troubling message to unsettle you, bring you anxiety, let you do as if you have to do something, you know, extra to be accepted. All true teachings must affirm the past tense of his work upon which all things we do derive its legitimacy. So we went through this. Galatians 1, 4, who gave himself, past tense. 1, 6, Galatians, called, past tense. Galatians 2, 20, crucified, past tense. Galatians 3, 2, received, past tense. Galatians 3, 3, having begun, past tense. Galatians 4, says, God has sent, past tense. Galatians 5, 23, have crucified. See that? So we've talked about that. All right, so I want to move here into um, 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 16. Again, just quick, briefly. Still to show you that the another gospel will not emphasize what we have received. And once, and once that area is not emphasized, it will not benefit the believer. Now, if you study salvation very carefully, the reason why we need the nature of Christ is because in Adam, the nature of Adam is what is responsible for all the strange malaise of feelings we have in fact. Through the Adamic sin nature, it's why there's depression. It's why there's dissatisfaction. So man, losing their ground with God, began to fail or satisfy their life with other things. That is why Jesus said that the water that I shall give to you, when you drink it, you will never be thirsty again. What it means is that it will satisfy you that you don't have to resort to things to satisfy you. So a believer who is not well fed in the things that Christ has done would, is, this, is that believer who, even though they are born again, they are looking to things for satisfaction in their life. But if you study what we have in Christ very well consistently, I'm telling you, you will always be satisfied. Whether things are good or bad, you are satisfied. See, it doesn't mean that you not do what you have to do. No, you do things, but you realize that the level of being worried, the level of being bothered, the level of being depressed reduces the more you know about Christ because you have the spirit of Christ, which is the satisfaction. That is why a man's spirit needs to be born again. So when a person is not taught the true grace, salvation message, what happens is that you allow the person not to be satisfied and the person begins to look to other things for their satisfaction. That is why the church has come to a place where they think we need entrepreneurship to be taught in church because what it means is that the gospel is not satisfying. It's not able to help. See that? But the gospel is about, about spirit nature of man. It's not about physical things. Physical things are a second line. But they mean to, once a person knows who they are in Christ, then the greatest problem, the greatest problem is solved. Their spirit being satisfied. Their spirit being satisfied. Their spirit being satisfied. Because in the natural world, the number one cause of all these things is dissatisfaction. It's dissatisfaction that makes an unbeliever wants to adorn himself with only riches. His, his wealth is riches. The number of cars, can you see the number of cars they have? You go to Facebook. Look at the unbelievers. Look at look at the look at look at the musicians. Look at what who, what did they parade when they do a video? You saw you see them holding bundles of money. You know they buy ten cars. They are not satisfied. Twenty cars. They are not satisfied. See that? Then the ones who are not also rich, they take it out on other things, alcohol, you know, stuff. You know they use things things to 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 feel that they are they 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 they, they are worthy, as important as they are. But God knows the root of that problem. Welcome to Steve here, Jose. God knows the root of that problem. The root of that problem is the fact that because their spirit is not born again and has Adamic nature, nothing satisfies them. Because there's a gap in their life. There's a, there's a vacuum in their life. That's why Jesus Christ said that, I am the bread that cometh down from heaven. A man will eat and will be satisfied. See that? The word bread there is significant of his spirit. So when a person is a Christian and they just go to church, they only pray, but they don't study the facts of what Jesus has done, they will also fall in the same category. They will not be satisfied. That is what we call them carnal Christians 
or nominal Christians. They don't see the importance of the word. They don't see what the word will do for them. So they are born again, all right, but they are looking to cars, houses, to tell them who they are, as important as cars, houses are necessary. But now they are making that an end in itself. But God designed that the word of the knowledge of who you are should satisfy you. Even though I'm chasing after houses, I'm chasing after cars, I'm doing my work, I'm going to school, but I'll, I'll see that that is only secondary for planet Earth. And because those things change, they change over time, your, your hope, your hope is not fixed in them. So otherwise, if your hope is fixed in them, when there is money, you are happy. When there's no money, you are sad. Money, happy. No money, sad. Happy, sad. Happy, sad. Depressed, depressed. Happy, sad. You see, you see now, you see, you are, you, are, you are being now controlled by external factors. So when they say the world, something is happening which is successful, yay, you are there. When it's not happening, you don't have any hope. God did not design man to be dependent on those things for their life. That is why the apostles were serious about this another gospel. This another gospel makes you look to other things to be accepted things and other things to feel complete. So when people say, oh, it doesn't matter, they say, it matters. Why would they be so serious about that? It matters. And this is what is happening in the body of Christ, that people are going to church, but some of them even slip out of church and go to see native doctors for help. Why? Because they were not trained in who they are in Christ. They were not trained in their righteousness, who they are. They are born again, but they don't see the importance of prayer. They don't see the importance of the word. To them, Christianity is all about getting. They see Christianity, they call it another name, solution center. No, Christianity is not a solution center. No, it is a life in Christ. It should satisfy you. So that's why I said 2 Timothy 3, 15 to 16, and that from a child thou has known Timothy, you know it well, the Holy Scriptures. And the word Holy Scriptures is from the Greek word heros grammar. It means writings that, that deal specifically with one thing. No other writings in the world deals with that subject. See? Which are able to make the wise, the Greek word for wise is sophizo. That means it's something over time you begin to see it. You see? That's why you have to read it every day. You know, you cannot read it one day and not read it again. You cannot hear me today and you never go back to the word again. No, then you will not come to know. It is this, that is what causes the confusion. That's why people are confused, you see, because they are not giving themselves to the word. So they, can, they cannot come to the arrival point of seeing that the word of God that in Christ satisfies, gives me stability, fills up the vacuum, gives me joy. It takes time for that awareness to come. That's why I said it's able to make the, you know, over a period of time, why so fizzle? Like, like a skill that you learn, like the skill of riding a bicycle. You, 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 when you've never ridden a bicycle, you try to ride, you fall down. You try to ride, you fall down. You try and get your stability. Then you go on bit by bit. Soon you become a master. Soon you can take your hands off the handlebars. Soon you can take, put a second person on the bicycle and ride with the person. Soon you can carry things on your head and ride the bicycle. You know how to keep your balance. But if you don't give yourself to it, you don't know. It's able to make you wise unto salvation. The, the Greek word for salvation is soteria. It means preservation, healing, wholeness. Look at all those words. Prosperity, abundance, nothing missing, nothing broken, satisfaction. It will, it will make you come and realize that that what Christ gave brings you deliverance, brings you wholeness, brings you healing, brings you prosperity, brings you satisfaction. But it will not happen if you do it once in a while. Once in a while. If you are not consistent with your Bible reading, in a while. If in church, once in a while. You will not see it. You will not see it. Because it's a living thing. He said then, because of that, he said, all scripture, that this time the word there is pasagraphe. When you put all scripture, Genesis to Malachi, because when this was written, it was talking about Genesis to Malachi. The other books were not ready. When you put it together, it's still talking about salvation by faith. But you don't know it. That's why I said it will make you wise as you keep on reading it, as you keep on reading it, as you keep on reading it. The examples and the explanations are in there. It will become clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer and clearer. You see the pattern. 
and just and this pattern was given raw by the inspiration of God and it's profitable what is profitable salvation by faith through faith in Christ that means when you teach you use the old testament to teach any other thing then it will not be profitable the word profitable is the greek and ophilimos it will not profit the person what will not profit the person they will not get the satisfaction they will not get the boldness they will not get the courage they will not know who they are in christ they are christians all right but they are looking for things to satisfy them to things to let them know whether they are worthy things to let them know whether they are accepted things to let them know whether they have identity and he said so this genesis to malachi the purpose of it is to explain these things to you that's why all through the Old Testament, God was doing things for Israel to let them know that in me you have satisfaction, in me you have stability. Nothing in the world can give you that. That vacuum can only be filled by me to explain that. And so in that explanation, you see the proof. The Greek is electros. See that? Then it goes on for correction, epanotosis. The correction there is not like you are wrong, you are wrong. I'm using a stick. The correction I said yesterday, the, the, the correction there is about to set your mind correct. Before you knew Christ, your mind was all over. You had wrong concept about God. But this teaching brings you the correction. It sorts your mind out. And it trains you like you training your little child. That is what is to train you in. What is it trying to train you in? In righteousness. What is righteousness? It's the cow. That's the Greek word. It means how you stand with God. That God always accepts you. What does that do to you? Confidence. That God will never count sin against you again. What does that give you? Satisfaction. That you are always accepted. What does that give you? Peace. So that it, it, it makes you conscious of the how you stand with God. Under the Old Testament, they didn't have any standing with God. Under the Old Testament, they did not have any standing with God. They could not approach God. They don't have what we have. So the Old Testament shows you how they suffered, how it was hard, how it was difficult for them to have approach with God. And we in Christ, we have gotten it. So we should be appreciative of it. So this another gospel, when it does not understand these facts, makes him feel like you are not accepted. You are not worthy. God is angry at you. You know, you have to do so many things for God to accept you. It dents and weakens your confidence. That is why Hebrews says that let us come onto the throne of grace with boldness. Boldness means openness, frankness, and ashamed. So if you are a believer in Christ and you don't know this and you are going to pray you are, in your prayer, you are begging God, oh, Father, please help me to do this. You are using please. It means that you have not been trained in righteousness. You are still thinking like Old Testament relationship. Your mind has not been brought up to know that you have a right standing with God. That since the day you got born again, you are always accepted. Can you see that now? So this another gospel changes that, makes you feel like you don't have a right stand. You don't have a right approach. God will not always hear you. You have to do A, B, C, D before God will hear you. That is the another gospel. So though they are saying, yes, Christ died for you, he died. However, look, until you sow dangerous seed, God will not hear you. That is, that's, that's another gospel. Very, very subtle. And they pick a lot of Bible verses from the book of Psalms. And Psalms, remember, David was not born again. So if you are still approaching God with hesitancy, you are saying, please, God, I beg you. It's a sign that you are still, that's why you training in righteousness. That means you have still not been brought up. You are not matured in how you stand with God in Christ. That area is still not clear to you. It's still not clear to you. If you are begging God, you are saying, please. You are confessing your sins every day. Every day. You think that, so God has got something against you. You see, instruction, the Greek pedia. We get the word pediatrics. Like you train a child, you give the child potty training. You train them to be able to take care of themselves. So you have not been trained to know that God has taken care of you. He stands okay with you. So the profitability of the scriptures, 
Old Testament is when they are used to explain salvation through faith in Christ, and the result of it will be this reproof. Reproof, you see that? Evidence. Correction. Your mind is corrected. Instruction. You have been trained how you stand with God. That is the message for the church. And it takes a while. People don't understand. Pastor Preston, can, how can we come to church and every day we are, we are talking about? Yes. Yes. Because there's identity crisis. Our identity was marred, destroyed by Adam and destroyed by Old Testament examples, destroyed by society, destroyed by your parents, destroyed by school. Look at school. Look at the things they told you. They insulted you. So by the time you come to Christ, you are battered in your image. So now you have to learn to learn. Look at how many believers, even after 10 years in Christ, they still don't have self-confidence. They don't have self-confidence. They don't have self-confidence. They don't have self-confidence. They are still afraid. They are still not sure. They don't know how to pray. They pray begging God. They confess their sin every day, every minute, every hour, every second. They think they've done something that God is paying them back. Look at that. You are still thinking like this. Then you have not been trained in righteousness. Your right stand with God. And that is what the another gospel does. It steals from you. It robs from you. Your confidence in God. So you are, it looks like you are never sure. Always learning. Always learning. But you are not able to come to application of it. Mm, 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 mm. Oh, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory, glory. Glory, glory. So this another gospel, ladies and gentlemen, you must detest it with vehemence. It will rob you of your boldness in Christ. So this means that, that Jesus explained the scriptures as concerning himself. It also means that all Jesus' teachings in the four gospels were about himself. The, these teachings were done with scriptures, Genesis to Malachi. Bible study, therefore, is to allow the Bible chapters and verses explain and validate subject matters for himself. It is to streamline our explanation of the various events, occurrences, and human activities primarily in the light of salvation through faith in Christ Jesus as presented in the epistles. It is to learn of Christ. Bible teaching concerning any subject matter is not looking for scriptures to back up one's opinions, to back up one's ideas, or to our experiences, rather it is to understand exactly what has been well explained in the scriptures and teach the same salvation by faith or through faith in Christ. Is that what gives a man stability? This is what Jesus was trying to get across to Israel in the parables, in the Beatitudes, in all his work. That in me is that stability of your spirit. In me is that satisfaction. And you've got hundreds of Christians who go to church every day. And yet they don't know who they are in Christ. They are always fearful, always timid, always hesitant, always begging God. Always confessing their sins every minute, every second, every hour. Singing songs like, I need thee every hour. The man lives in you. You see? All that is mindset. You have not been trained in your stand with God. Training in righteousness. How you stand with God. So you want to tell me that people like Abraham, David, Jacob, Samson, enlisted in Hebrews 11, they were all called righteous. But yet, the Adamic sin nature was in them. And yet, the Bible said that they stopped the mouth of lions, without speaking in tongues, without the name of Jesus, without the Holy Spirit living inside them. And you and I, who have received the fullness of the Spirit, we go to prayer begging God. And when trouble comes, we don't even know what to do. We don't know what to do. 
because we don't know what to do, we end up saying, maybe it is God's will. We don't know our authority in Christ. That's what the another gospel will do. So let me deal with something here. So this understanding of the genuine gospel, what is the gospel? Good news, what is good news? Something new that is good, something new that is good. What is this something new that is good? How we'll stand with God, why? Because Adam messed it up. So we lost our stand with God. Therefore, in the Old Testament, to approach God and even try and get a stand with him, you need to do it by the sacrifice of animals, laws, and confess your sins, and see the high priest. It was practiced for years. So that has corrupted man's thinking that unless they do something, they will not be accepted. That is how religions were born, man's own approach, because they saw in Israel, Israel was doing rituals, Israel was doing festivals, and they thought there was some magic formula in it without understanding why the root cause, Adam's sin. So Jesus comes and calls and says, no, no, in Luke 24, I have removed the thorny issue, sin nature. Go and preach forgiveness of sins. That when they believe, they have approachability to me and they have equal status with me. So now that education is where the battle lies. So that explanation means that it has been done in Christ. It was given as a gift. Do you realize salvation, a gift. Righteousness, a gift. Holy Spirit, a gift. Do you work for a gift? So why are they now putting conditions? It is a lack of proper understanding of the word of God. That's what Paul always established in all their writings, chapter one, chapter two, that you have a correct standing with God. You are united with God. You are superior to Satan. He, has, he establishes that first. And when you go to Romans chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, he uses Abraham as an example to say that, what did Abraham obtain? How come Abraham is called righteous? A, a man with so many mistakes, he believed, that is all. And Abraham had audacity that we who are in Christ, that the, now that it has been fulfilled, we, don't, we are even afraid. We are even commanding the name of Jesus, your knee is shaking. In the name of G, 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 you are not bold, you are afraid, full of fear. But when the Bible says that God has not given the spirit of timidity, of fear, but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. The word sound is a Greek word, hugainu, complete, wholesome, nothing lacking. So that teaching of what grace is, said so that you will allow those who what, mingle law with grace. That is, that is another gospel. So we said that another gospel, heteros evangelion, which is the Greek word, another gospel is when they preach the gospel and they add conditions before God will accept you. That was Old Testament style. Or they put in, what is it? Certain things you must do, performance. That is under the law. Or they put in future tense. That is still another gospel, under the law. Or they put conditional tenses under the law. So, so long as it is not done in Christ and all you did is to receive it, that is another gospel. That is what is called foundational explanation. So let us look at it. That means that if this, this explanation is not clear in your mind, your interpretation of the Bible will go awry you will never be able to interpret the Bible correctly. This understanding of what the Bible teaching is and Jesus as the subject of the scriptures is what is referred to as the foundation or irrevocable absolute basis of what the entire theme of the Bible is. Totally Christocentric. It centers around the person of Christ and what he has done. You were not there when he died. You were not there when he went to hell. You were not there when he resurrected. You only grew up to come and meet it and hear. You believed and received it. When you were receiving it, he did not say, wait until you are perfect. Then now that you have received it, now you are putting conditions to be perfect. It doesn't make sense. That's why he said in Ephesians chapter one, you are made acceptable to Christ from the day you got born again. Because the person that God is looking at is the Christ in you. All conditions is between man and man. 
God does not need conditions to be accepted. He accepted you in Christ. What Christ did is enough. More than enough. Ultra enough. Hyper enough. But when it comes to man, he will need conditions because we are dealing with human beings that are temperamental. God is not schizophrenic. He's not temperamental. He's not bipolar. He does not, you don't need to massage his ego for him to accept you. He accepts you in Christ before the foundations of the world. So let us look at some things here. 1 Corinthians 3.10. Now, once again, before I go into this 1 Corinthians, you know, we human beings, we are really very funny. We, I mean, I'll discuss with a sister later. We are very, very, very funny. The man is saying that when you believe me, I'll never count sins against you again. You say no. Ah, what are you saying? Yet, you are the same person. You cannot even, in a day, you cannot even obey one, five laws. You can't even obey them. By the time you drive from your home to your office, you have gone through two red lights. You have shouted at somebody, slammed the door. Ah, then you are the same person, you say. <laughs> you see, Pastor Fred, what you are saying, you know, hey, by sin, you have to be very careful, you know, otherwise God will be angry with you. Look at that. Look at that. You have not been trained in righteousness. Oh, and, and this one, we, we, we find it strange that a believer would divorce. <laughs> but it is okay that the believer will lose their salvation. <laughs> Don't you understand? That is the same thing. Being born again is to be married to Christ. He said, I married you to one, Christ. So you are saying that it's okay on planet Earth. It's, it's not okay on planet Earth to divorce. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That one, we, you argue tooth and nail with me. Oh, but a believer can lose their salvation. That means that Christ can divorce. <laughs> can divorce the believer. You know, it is so absurd that, you know, it beggars sort of unbelief. It's just shocking the way we think. The man is saying, I did it for you. Receive it. You say, no, I don't want to accept that. I want the one with laws. Give me laws. Then this is a third classic. This is the this is the this is the third classic. The people who are arguing with you about grace, you ask them this question: Have you read the Bible yourself from Genesis to Revelation before? No. Have you read any other book of the Bible from cover to cover? Whether it's one Corinthians, two Corinthians, Romans? No. So what makes you think that you know the Bible? Eh, but they've been saying. So you don't know it for yourself? No. So what is the basis of your argument? Eh, but everybody is doing it. Eh, they are saying, you are saying eh, they say that if you do this, then you will not go to heaven. Who said it? I don't know, but I heard it. Ah, ah. So you are telling me that you are going by ESC. Wow, I'm surprised. I am really surprised. So the problem there is pride. That is the problem. It's serious pride. <laughs> That is where the problem is. So you have to be humble. So let's look at 1 Corinthians 3.10. God has given me unique gifts as a skilled master builder who lays a good foundation. Who is, who is talking? Paul. Who is he talking to? The, ch the church in Corinth. He said, God has given the unique gift. What is he referring to? He's talking about the fact that he was given the direct revelation of seeing that the entire Bible is about salvation by faith in Christ. And that, that relationship we have in Christ is different from that in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, it was conditions and it was also performance because the sin of, of Adam was inside man as a DNA. But now that you have received Christ, the sin of Adam's DNA is out. You have received the nature of Christ. That is where people read Galatians chapter 5 and they don't understand because I just saw it in somebody's mind. The person is saying to themselves, what about Galatians chapter 5? Galatians chapter 5 is not saying that you are born again and therefore you no more commit sin. Galatians chapter 5, the word flesh is talking about the man without Christ. He's not talking about you, the believer, you are committing sins. The works of the flesh, the word flesh is sacks. The works of the flesh or the practices as a lifestyle of the man without Christ is this result. And he's also saying that whether the person does it or not, because they are in Adam, that, that, that characteristics are there. Then he said the fruit of the spirit. What spirit? The born again spirit. 
He's not talking about that you're a Christian. So when you do small, this small, that means that that means that you are in flesh and you lose yourself. That's not what he's talking about. Read it in context. So the foundation is what? What Jesus laid down as an emphasis from Genesis to Malachi. Salvation, my faith. He said, after another craftsman comes and builds on it. So builders beware. Who is the builders? Preachers of the gospel. Beware that you don't add to it. What should you not add? Don't put conditions. If you don't do this, God will not hear you. If you don't do this, God will not hear you. God is angry. God. You have not understood righteousness. Let every builder do his work carefully. That's the same word he used when he talked about 2 Timothy 3. He talked about that. Steady to show yourself approved unto God. A workman that did not to assume correctly. The same word here is carefully. The Greek word here is ototomio. It's like a surgeon, a doctor who is doing an, a, a surgery and he's, he cuts around the organ carefully, but he does it carefully because he knows all the organs very well and he knows that if the knife touches the spleen, the spleen will be cut and the person, it will affect the person. So he knows where the spleen is. He knows where the pancreas is. He knows where the kidneys are. So he's careful not to mess it up. According to God's standard. God's standard is not morality. He's talking about the way it is explained. First Corinthians 3, 11, for no one is empowered to lay in an alternative foundation, an alternative explanation to grace. Grace is what God did in Christ. No human being can add. You only believe and receive. And when you believe and receive, you are not perfect the day you received it. And then they tell you it is your works, especially among my country folks. It is your works that will take you to heaven. If it is your works that will take you to heaven, then it was not necessary for Jesus to die. I said, if it is your works that will take a man to heaven, then Jesus needlessly had to die. There was no need. That means what Jesus did is not perfect. It's not excellent. It's not complete. For where? Then go and spend three days and three nights in hell. Go and spend three days and three nights in hell. Go to the cross. Go on the cross. Let them put nail through you. It will not even do anything because Adamic sin nature is inside. How can your works take you to heaven? Where? 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 In, if, if it was so, then Israel will be the first to go to heaven. There are 613 laws they could not obey. That's what the Bible said. By the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. God is helping you. You are angry. He's saying that you, I don't need works. Believe in me. You say, no, I want the works. I want, no, 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 Pastor Fred. No, me, I want the works. I want the works. Well done. Continue in the works. Don't forget. Make sure that you've got two goats ready. Don't forget. Make sure that you have to travel to Israel with your two goats. Don't forget. Go and look for a high priest. Go and look for the temple. You have to obey 613 laws, including all the festivals. Because he said, if you obey one, obey all. If you fail in one, you are failed in all, according to the law. So your works can never take you to heaven. Because your works did not die for you. That is the foundation he's talking about. Hey, Pastor Fred, hmm, so are you saying that the word, that's what I'm showing you Bible verses on the screen. It is, you see, I was sharing with the sister. You see, the problem for we Africans is not the gospel. It is culture. We are preaching the gospel with culture. We are using our culture to try and use it to teach the gospel. Because in my culture, if I'm a father and you do me something wrong, I will punish you. That is culture. That is not Bible. You are thinking with God like, you, like God is a natural human being. He said that, for no one is empowered to lay any alternative foundation. What is he referring to? That salvation is through faith in Christ only, minus works, minus conditions, minus performance. In the sight of God, between man and man, I'll need that, but not before God. He said, other than the good foundation that exists, where, which is where, where, which is Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the foundation. What He did is the is what covers everything. 
look at the look at let me close it first Corinthians 3 12 30. so the foundation is how is, is the foundation just means the explanation so if the explanation is telling you that hey hmm, eh, I know you are born again hmm, I know you are born but be careful oh I'm a prayer for you that we shall all make heaven since the day you met Jesus you have made heaven didn't you hear Jesus in John chapter 3 he that believeth he that believeth will never come into condemnation. John 5 talks about the same thing. The believing is at the point when the gospel is preached. So that is the explanation, the foundation. He said, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 13. Now, from the human point of view, it looks, hey, hey, Pastor Fred. Hey, so you are saying that even though I'm born again, man, if I do anything, God will forgive me. Exactly. That's why he, he, that's why he gave the example of Abraham four times. Romans, Galatians, James, and Hebrews. Abraham was an idol worshiper. He was not perfect when God met him. He was never perfect even when he believed in God. Lied twice to the king of Egypt about his wife. He said, 1 Corinthians 3, 12 to 13. The quality of materials used by anyone building, that is the explanation of grace, will soon be made clear. Whether it has been built with gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, and straw. Now, this statement here, all language, is language, okay? He's, he's using, he's using, he's using, he's using, um, he's using figures of speech, right? He's dealing with, he's dealing with purity of the explanation, motive. He said that if, whether it's gold, the motive in mind, silver, the motive. Costly stones, the motive, or wood or hair stone. Their work will soon become evident for the day will make it clear. What day is he talking about? He's talking about, now you have to be very careful here in this explanation. The believer in Christ without works, once he believes, is heaven bound, no reservation. But when we get to heaven, our judgment is not like the judgment of the unbeliever because we have already believed. Ours is speech and prize giving day. And it will be in two or three main areas. One, how many souls you brought to Christ? Two, in the preaching of the gospel, what was your motive for to qualify for the prize? The aim is not for you to go to hell. But if your prize is to be 100%, if your motive was to gain popularity, fame, so you preach another gospel, then the percentage will do 10 points will be deducted, 20 points will be deducted. So you will not receive your crown. And later I'll explain what the crown is. The crown is not physical crown. But you are in heaven. He said, for the day will make it clear because it will be revealed by blazing fire and the fire will test and prove the workmanship of each builder. Fire is figure of speech. It is not fire or ja, no, it's figure. He's just trying to say that there is a basis. There is a marking scheme. That's what he's just talking about. There is a curriculum. If you don't preach according to what is it that not is not mixed, it's grace. What Christ did. If you start to preach what Christ did, and you start to mix it with conditions, you have failed the test. You see that now? You have failed the test in your preaching. It sounds good. People have gathered, it excites, but you have not taught them anything. It's empty. It's empty. So they are the same. That's why I tell you, there are some believers, I've known them for years. They are still the same. They have not learned anything new. They are still believing that, you know, God is angry at them. They are still believing on generational curses. They are still believing. Still, 20 years, they are still believing those things. Why? Where they go to, they are not teaching them the word. That's what I mean. Empty. Empty. Folks, in conclusion, if Jesus don't notice that his death was going to be necessary, then why would he come and die? Because he saw that nobody could do it. Nobody could do it. He did it for us. And he did not, and when he was doing it for us, he did not require you, he did not require you to be perfect. He, did, he didn't have any guarantee that even when you receive it, you change. 
when he was going to the cross, he had no guarantee. I said, he had no guarantee. So why now that he has done it, now he's going to ask you for conditions, which our forefathers could not even bear. So it is human thinking and human religion that makes it think like that. And we are going to continue tomorrow. That foundation is secure. All you need to do is to know it very well so that Satan does not play tricks in your mind as if that there's something missing. This is the purpose of the church. The church is to teach the body of Christ the things we have received in Christ, not to waste your, our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Do we have any questions, please?